A listener's note before we begin. The following episode contains adult themes and content of a violent nature. It may not be suitable for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. At the end of the last episode, we introduced you to Leon Jodry. At around 4 a.m. on Sunday, April 19th, Leon had just woken up at his home on Portapique Crescent. The private road forms a loop to the east of Orchard Beach Drive, in between Gabriel Wortman's warehouse and the Blueberry Field Road where police say he made his escape just before 11 p.m. More than six hours had passed since Wortman set off on a violent rampage and Leon had slept through the violence. So I turn my phone and I usually go on Facebook, have a coffee, take my dogs out. My phone goes ding, ding. Like he said at the end of the last episode, he started getting messages from concerned friends, people nearby who had seen fires burning for hours and were worried. As soon as he went outside, he could smell smoke. He got in his truck to see what was going on. So I go out Orchard Beach Drive, so I go past Frank and Don's house. It's burnt. Don't know that. It's four in the morning. I'm half asleep. Haven't had my coffee yet. Dogs are home. Lights are on. Radio's on. Pulled my window down, made left on Port Pick Beach Road. Drive down. I seen a flicker of flame past the graveyard. I see fucking Gabriel's house. I seen the SWAT vehicle sitting there. I said he burned his own house. Dumb son of a bitch. When he thinks about those early hours of April 19th, the memories come flooding back. It's clear in Leon's voice that it all happened in a dizzying blur of chaos and adrenaline. Leon walked us through what he saw that night, moment by moment, and it's harrowing. So we're going to share what he saw from that first drive through Portapique to the moment police say was a crucial turning point in their investigation. And in this episode, you're also going to hear from police for the first time as they tried to navigate those same dark, unfamiliar roads. West Iron Echo, any members there? Anyone that ping uh, Wartman's cell phone yet? He has one on file. 10-4 we did, and it's showing off, and it's uh, associated to the female, Lisa Banfield. I'm your host, Sarah Ritchie, and this is 13 Hours Inside the Nova Scotia Massacre. Episode 8, Daybreak. As Leon drove down Portapique Beach Road toward Wortman's Cottage, he saw police vehicles parked out front. They were the RCMP's specialized tactical unit, the emergency response team, known as ERT. But you'll notice Leon called them SWAT. I pulled up beside the SWAT vehicle, had my window down. It's dark. I look up. I can see the guy looking at the window. He's past your window. He's screaming at me. I can't hear him. I keep saying, I had my hands out. I don't know what you're saying. I didn't get out of my truck. I stayed in my truck. He didn't get out. Kept yapping away, so I pulled ahead 10 feet. I said, well, I'll just keep going. I knew who they were looking for. He burned his own house. They weren't sitting there for nothing. So I went to drive ahead, and they loud speak me and pulled the lights on. You in the black truck turned around and proceeded to the entrance point. I'm half asleep. I'm thinking, entrance point? I didn't come from the entrance point. Screw you. So I stopped on the way back. He's still hollering at me over the loudspeaker to get out of there, so I left. He was talking about the entrance point to the community at Portapique Beach Road and Highway 2. That's where police had been stationed since they arrived on scene, which the RCMP say was at 10.26 p.m., almost six hours earlier. Police blocked that entrance point and were looking for Gabriel Wortman within a perimeter that included Portapique Beach Road, where his cottage was burning, Orchard Beach Drive, where his warehouse was aflame, and the surrounding woods. So why was the emergency response team on Portapique Beach Road just after 4 a.m.? Well, for the first time, we can tell you with certainty. They were meeting to come up with a plan. We're going to take you through several hours of the early morning in this episode. At times, we'll need to stop and backtrack to catch up. We're going to tell you what was happening with Leon Jodry and with the RCMP, and with the gunmen at different times. So we'll end this part of our story after 7 a.m. with the gunmen. But we're going to begin at around 1 a.m. with the police. Back in our early episodes, we shared audio recordings from first responders, and we told you we didn't have recordings from police. They use encrypted channels to ensure their communications can't be heard by just anyone with a scanner. 
But it turns out the RCMP actually used an unencrypted channel for part of the night. We did ask the RCMP why this happened, but they didn't answer our questions. Between 1 and 4 a.m., the Pictou County Public Safety Channel was, for the most part, used by the RCMP in Porter Pick. Go for us to travel. Uh, Timmy, I just want to go over our mission and all that stuff for everybody. Just uh, just a reminder, mission here is to contain the area and locate and arrest uh, our suspect in this. Our suspect is Gabriel Warman. Our authorities are working under his uh, name, uh, criminal code authorities of murder, arson. These recordings come from the same website as the other calls from first responders that we shared in episode three. It's called Broadcastify. It has thousands of live audio streams from radio channels across North America. Police, fire, ambulance services. It also has an archive of these streams. When we went looking for calls from April 18th and 19th, initially we looked at the channels that cover all of Nova Scotia and the channels closest to Portapique. That's where we found the emergency health services recordings. But then a few weeks before this episode was released, We got a tip from another reporter who's been following this story who let us know these police recordings were out there. It seems they'd been on the Pictou County Channel archives all along. We just didn't know to look there because that's not even the same county as Portapique. These recordings paint the clearest picture yet of what was happening overnight. So we're going to take some time to listen to what was going on in those early hours. You'll hear that police were dealing with communication issues and confusion in part caused by false sightings of the gunman. We'll start at 1.09 a.m. This is when police first started talking about reports coming from the community of five houses. That's just on the other side of the Portapic River from the gunman's cottage. It's about a five minute drive away. Officers there had seen what they thought was a car flashing its lights. But you'll hear there seemed to be confusion over where the car was and who should respond to it. Regular RCMP members or ERT. 355, the car on Five Houses Road is flashing its lights repeatedly at us. I'd say just honker in place, don't approach at this point. ERT's on scene. Find out, Bravo 1 copies. Honker in place. Where's that vehicle at from my uh, jersey? It's on Five Houses Road, and it's a uh, good 400, 500 yards off of uh, number two highway. Five minutes later, at 114. 355 from 29 Bravo 1, vehicle on Five Houses Road, flashing lights again. Then at 1.18 a.m., someone on Bayshore Road, also in Five Houses, called 911 saying they'd seen a person in their yard with a flashlight. You'll hear an officer refer to the possible SOC, meaning subject of concern. So just in relation to that last call in uh, for the individual over on Bayshore Drive, uh, flashlight unknown, possible SOC, uh, Lafferty, George, and McDonald are in position if you need extra members to attend over there to verify her. Call member standby, allow the risk manager to dispatch you, please. No members are near this place, and this person says there's someone out on their yard with a flashlight one round. But as you'll hear, there were apparent radio issues that morning. These next few calls happen over about four minutes. I am. You're completely digital. Who's ever speaking to me? Jeffrey Hill, Sergeant O'Brien, I was just telling members not to offer up their services to wait until the risk manager dispatched them. Oscar Charlie, uh, Staff Halliday, uh, can you re-announce uh, you're in command, you were digital, no one copied. All units on board of call, Staff Sergeant Jeff West, I am on scene at the Great Village Fire Hall, and I am taking over command and control this time. Staff West is on scene is now in control of this matter. So by 1.24 a.m., Staff Sergeant Jeff West was in control of the search for Gabriel Wartman. You'll hear others refer to him as Oscar Charlie on these calls. The next several hours of recordings show how challenging that search was. At 1.29 a.m., police were still concerned about the car flashing its lights in the neighboring community. 
They started talking about that on those recordings about 20 minutes before. Is there going to encounter that car you're talking about flashing their lights going down that road? Or is that vehicle still there flashing their lights? Turn onto the road. You copy that, Eric? You're going to encounter a vehicle who's been flashing their lights at these members. The recordings also show that police were having trouble navigating the area as the emergency response team tried to find the home of the person who had called 911. Yeah, copy that. We're just coming up, I believe, to the firehouse road. Do we go down there? 10 4. Obey Shore Road, be off the right or left here. When you go down that road, it's going to fork, and Bay Shore is to the left of the fork. Copy that. Left of the fork, 67 Bay Shore Road. And 67 should be on your left. The confusion continued past 1.30 a.m. Yeah, we must have drove faster there. We're down at the very bottom and took a left. Uh, we're going back on Bayshore now, I believe. Three names, like Shady Lane is one, Nature's Lane. Yeah, Shady Lane was to our right. We took a left instead of going shady, so we'll go back up on Bayshore. Okay, you're going to see another one on your right, just beyond that is 67. All right, we're just passing Nature Lane coming back on Bayshore. Okay, and Bayshore does go to your right, but keep going straight again to where you came down. It looks like the second house on the right is 67 Bayshore Road. What's that road off there? Well, it'll be our right now coming out just above Nature and Shady. That's also Bayshore. It goes all the way around back to that first member you encountered. So keep going straight. It loops right around. Outside of a red faded residence there. I don't see a number, though. Police were trying to investigate these reports of flashing lights and a possible sighting of a person with a flashlight in five houses, but they were clearly having issues finding their way around. I don't really understand why. You can easily look up the addresses they're talking about on Google Maps. We don't know if there were issues with cell service or mobile internet service that night. We do know from these recordings that officers were calling one another on their cell phones at various times. Service in rural Nova Scotia is notoriously poor. But earlier in the night, police did talk about cell coverage. West Iron Echo, any members there? Anyone that ping uh, Wartman's cell phone yet? He has one on file. No, I'm channel. No, I understand you have a, maybe a possible suspect for that shooting. I wonder if you're pinged his cell phone. 10 4 we did, and it's showing off, and it's uh, associated to the female, Lisa Banfield. Definitely thanks. Off or out of range, I should put that. What's your cell coverage looking like in that general area, like strong coverage? Yeah, that's the cell tier. We've had coverage the whole time. We asked the RCMP why they were having trouble navigating, and they refused to answer our questions. Meanwhile, another 911 call came in, this time from Portapic, and you might recognize the name. The call was about Clinton Ellison. You may remember from episode three that Clinton and his brother Corey had seen a fire start near their dad's house on Orchard Beach Drive. Corey went to see what was happening, and he was killed by the gunman sometime between 10 and 11 p.m. Clinton found him and then fled into the woods. He later called his father, Richard Ellison, and told him he thought the gunman had been chasing him. At around 1.42 a.m., almost three hours later, he was still hiding in the woods. We just got another call. There's a male that's in the woods on Orchard Beach Road just past the school teacher's house. It's a big house with a white car in the driveway. And he uh, told our caller that his brother's dead up the road and he's uh, too scared to answer his phone, so he's hiding there. Hey, Clinton Ellison. I believe the school teacher's house was the one where the uh, initial complaint came in. So, uh, if that's the case, then that's just north of 136. Copy. I think it's safe to say that's not a new occurrence. There's been no gunshots uh, since we've been here, hunkered down. This is Sergeant O'Brien. Uh, Clinton Ellison called us at 2259, or called his father at 2259. The father called us indicating that his other son, Croy Ellison, was shot. This is related to that. Clinton was in Portapic, in the woods near Lisa McCulley's house, according to these calls. Meanwhile, the emergency response team was in five houses. 
The only way for Ert to get to him was to head back to Highway 2 and go around the river. I still have that caller on the line that's on Portapique Road, terrified. He's hiding behind a tree stump near uh, a private road. The sign says private road. It's a small cabin. How far is that location from uh, 67 Bayshore? I believe it's uh, like the next road subdivision over. I'm going to see if somebody can ping this, his cell phone so we can get a better Latin law. He um, doesn't have a time frame because uh, he's been hiding for a while in the cold, but he says that he uh, did have somebody following him at one point with a flashlight turning it on and off. Um, but he doesn't know if that's an hour ago or two hours ago or a few minutes ago. It's clear from these recordings that police were also concerned the gunmen could still be lying in wait. That's a kid on the phone there. Uh, just FYI, that's where the suspect uh, lives down in that area, right? I think the kid on the phone has just found his brother that was shot a couple hours ago and is just too scared to go anywhere, so he's hiding in the woods. Copy, just making sure it's not our suspect uh, looking for an ambush on us. Just before 2 a.m., Ert was still in five houses dealing with that report of the person with the flashlight. Yeah, I'm just wondering with this young fellow here who's hunkered in place, a civilian, um, what a plan to get him out of there. As we uh, finish uh, here. At this point, it had been about 20 minutes since a 911 dispatcher told police that Clinton was hiding in the woods. It had been three hours since Clinton's dad called 911 to tell them Corey had been murdered. Clinton was waiting, terrified, in the cold. But Ert was still tied up in five houses, where a police dog unit was now checking out the yard. The dog is uh, showing some interest here back out on the road, but can't determine the direction or anything like that. There's nothing in around the residence, but showing a bit of interest here on the road, not a lot. Copy that. We'll go tell this guy we couldn't get a track around the house at all. And our next priority is to go get that uh, civilian uh, out of that area. The civilian they're talking about is Clinton. But to get to him, the emergency response team needed directions once again. If you're able to go to where this male is hiding, just uh, north of 20, Port of Crescent, to cross from Civic 23, he's in the woods. Yeah, copy that. So is that off Port of Beach Road? So basically, um, where 5 Bravo 4 and stuff are set up there at Port of Beach Road, yes. You head southbound, um, and it is, if you take... Portapic Crescent, just off of Orchard Beach Drive, it'll be towards the bottom. It does loop up and meet again with Orchard Beach Drive. So we go down Portapic Beach Road and take Orchard Beach Road? Yes, that's correct. Portapic Beach Road. I'm asking for directions as we're moving there, so we'll let you know when we're on Portapic Beach Road. And just after 2 a.m., it's still not clear what was happening with that car that was apparently still flashing its lights. I remember leaving that area. There was a car at the end of the road down there that kept flashing their lights at us. Was that vehicle searched or checked? Is that on Bayshore Road, that uh, car? Negative the road you turned down, uh, 5 Hounds Road, uh, right by the two PCs. There was a vehicle about 400, 500 meters down. Yeah, we didn't see a vehicle on the road. The lights are still on on that vehicle that we can see from our position on Highway 2. Saying the lights are still on that vehicle? 10 4. We're heading back to Florida Creek Beach Road, but we're going to check out a vehicle on the way by that uh, just watching the lights up numbers. You guys are past it. It's behind you, and it's on the driver's side. Yeah, that's in someone's uh, driveway there. That's a house. There's no uh, car on the road. Okay. It's, uh, it was flashing its lights multiple times in uh, different patterns at us. It's tough to tell from our distance. But that may not have been a car flashing its lights at all. The recordings never did make it clear exactly what those flashing lights were. Yeah, I thought, yeah, we drove by and uh, there's lights on at the house now. We gotta go get this civilian out there, so we got to our next priority. Come here. 
if you guys are there now and you got to go buy that car, the boys are saying he's been flashing the lights for a while there. Might not hurt just to check it on your way by, just in case the uh, subject is in there. There's no car on the side of the road there. It's in someone's yard type thing. Remember that police sources have told us they believed the gunman was still inside their perimeter in Portapique overnight. They were concerned he could be hiding somewhere. But over time, they also began to believe he may be dead in one of the burning buildings. The RCMP have also said this in press conferences. Around 2.10 a.m., more confusion, as the emergency response team tried to navigate the unfamiliar territory around Portapique. You're going to make your first left. It's going to be Orchard Beach Drive. Orchard Beach Drive. Stick to your left as you're heading southbound to an intersection called Port Pit Crescent. That's going to be around Civic 80 Orchard Beach Drive. Be advised that this incident is around 136123 Orchard Beach Drive, which it occurred. So before you go down Orchard Beach Drive all the way, take the left onto Port Pit Crescent. Do you copy? Too much too soon. So we're just coming down Port of Pickle, uh, Beach Road here, and you want us to take Orchard? Correct. You're going to take the fork that goes down Orchard Beach Drive. Like on Orchard Beach Drive. And it wasn't clear exactly where Clinton was. Are you pinging Clint- Clinton's cell phone? That's correct. That's who we're trying to get a hold of here. He said he was across from 23? Nope, that's where his last ping was coming across, was across from 23 in the woods just north of 20 Portapique Crescent. Copy that. What was the radius? 98 meters at that point. Copy. And that's where he headed from the woods, or to the road from. Is he still on the line? Yes. Is he on a road somewhere? I'm telling him to stay near that road to where he was hiding. Pain, just one sec. We're going to back down to the intersection, which is 30 meters from here. Okay, he says he can see the main road from the beach from where he is, but just stand by. There was another 10 minutes of confusion trying to find Clinton in the dark. If that's you that's coming towards him, he says he sees a light coming towards him, but there's something in the woods to the left of you. Yeah, he doesn't appear to be coming out at all. Uh, we're wondering if someone's trying to set us up for an ambush and they see the big truck here and they don't they don't want us to come out. This is the second time you've heard the police talk about the possibility of an ambush, first at 1.20 a.m. and then at 2.24. But remember, they're talking about this on a radio channel that anyone can listen to online or with a scanner. Nova Scotia RCMP moved to encrypted radio communications back in 2014. That was the same year three RCMP officers were killed in a shooting in Moncton, New Brunswick. A review of that incident found the officers searching for the gunmen were worried about giving away key information over radio because anyone could have been listening in, including the shooter. So police were worried about a possible ambush as they searched for the gunmen in Portapique, but they were using an unencrypted channel to talk about it and to give specific directions. Weren't they also worried the gunmen could be listening to them? We asked the RCMP if this switch to an unencrypted channel might have put their officers at risk, but they refused to answer our questions. Meanwhile, the emergency response team remained in the vehicle and continued driving around Portapic to find Clinton with the help of dispatchers. If you could tell him to walk down to the intersection, we'll be here waiting for him. Okay, he sees something strange in the woods on the right-hand side, so he's, he's terrified that he will walk towards the beach, but I believe he's on Port Pitt Crescent, so he's going to be eating, hitting that Orchard Beach Drive there um, in, a, in a bit if I can get him convinced to walk that way. And then, right around 2.30 a.m. So I need to drive out of the road there. He can sort of see your lights starting to walk towards your light. So he's going to start coming towards you, dressed all in black. Yeah. He's you? We got him. Meanwhile, the RCMP members on the scene and their commanders didn't know that Wartman had left Portapic hours before. It had been more than six hours since the first 911 calls came in from Portapic. 
More than five hours since the gunman escaped, according to the RCMP's own timeline. And at around 4 a.m., police decided to regroup. Foster Charlie, so we cast a dog all around there. There was no uh, track at all. Knocked on the door, and a uh, lady come to the door, woke her up, and uh, she said she wasn't flashing any lights. That she uh, heard gunshots earlier in the night, wondering why we were here, so just told her to keep the doors locked. So we're heading back to Port Effect Beach Road. I'll jump in uh, the burb and head down to meet with you guys, and they're going to go to 200. Uh, it's at, uh, outside suspect's house there while we come up with a plan. The emergency response team members went back to the gunman's cottage at 200 Portapique Beach Road, just after 4 a.m. This is around the same time that Leon Jodry said he was driving those same roads, trying to figure out what was going on. This is when Leon encountered Ert on Portapique Beach Road, when they told him to go back to the entrance point. I said, I'm going home, so I said, I'll wait till they get the idiot, and then I'll carry about my day. I never thought nothing of it. I turned down that road, not thinking nothing. I drive by Frank, so I've seen, seen a flicker of flame. Like, oh, my fuck. And then I said, it just hit me. Like, this isn't right. The house where he saw a flicker of flame was Frank and Don Galenchins on the corner of Orchard Beach Drive and Portapic Crescent. So I flattened it, and I went down past my road, and I hit the brakes right in front of Greg and Jamie's. And I looked in, no fire, dark. Flatten the truck again, hit the brakes in front of Lisa McCulley's, right across from Gabriel's warehouse, you called it. And the Allison body is there in the road, I guess. I didn't know that at the time. At least I didn't know where the bodies were. It's dark. Lisa's place is dark. So I flattened it down as far as Greg and Jamie's uh, parents' place. Leon drove past Corey Ellison's body in the darkness without realizing it. He saw that three properties had been burned, but he had no idea just how bad things were. The back home went in, got the shotgun, went in my house. What the freak's going on? Confused, right? So I called Greg around five after a while I started getting concerned. No answer. Well, what did he do? Sleep through it too? So I kind of lost interest then. Like, oh, well, everybody else slept through it. Just must be a coincidence. Although Frank's house is what had me nervous. Why is his house Frank burned? I couldn't figure what, and I wasn't leaving my house at dark. No fucking way. So I stayed in the house. It was getting on daylight and I was getting there just going over things and trying, didn't know what to do and nobody called me. Leon stayed in his house with his gun and his two dogs, nervously waiting for daylight. He was alone and he said police didn't come to his house not to tell him to evacuate or to shelter in place or to check who was there. And that night there, so there's 80 of these people that I was pretty close to, and they didn't evacuate anybody in that neighborhood that I know of. I've talked to a few of us that were left and never came to my door. When I got up at 4 in the morning and I drove out and that guy didn't turn me around, and when he sent me back, didn't he wonder who I was? Didn't he wonder where I came from? They assumed Gabriel was in there dead is what they assumed, is what came out of it later on. They thought he committed suicide. The world's worst thing is they assumed, and other people are dead because of their assumptions. The RCMP have said they helped some people get out of the community, like Greg and Jamie Blair's two young boys and Lisa McCauley's two kids, who hid and waited for help for hours. And of course, Clinton Ellison, who was rescued from the woods, but police believed the shooter was within the perimeter in Portapique. So as they searched, they said they told other people to shelter in place. Leon says he's haunted by what he lived through that weekend. He's angry about what happened. And like us, he has a lot of questions, especially for police. I slept through a horror movie and woke up to the aftermath of the worst day of my life. Where the hell was everybody? How did I drive around all these murder scenes with nobody around? Did everybody go to Tim Hortons? It's hard to have a lot of, like, I get a lot of stuff in my head, and I'm sorry if I get a little upset when I talk. I'm not like that. It's, how did that happen? That's the resounding question about the entire weekend. How did that happen? Listening to the recordings of police that night, the following things become clear. 
Police were being cautious as they searched for a violent killer in near total darkness, wary that he could be hiding anywhere in the woods. They were trying to navigate an area they didn't know well, and they were having trouble communicating. People who had survived the horror were panicked. The RCMP were trying to figure out how to catch someone they couldn't see and who had already slipped away. As the sun rose over Portapique, Leon was still at home with his two dogs, scared. It was around 6.30 a.m., two and a half hours since his encounter with police outside of Wartman's smoldering cottage. Police said what happened next is a moment that changed the course of their investigation because that's when the banging started at Leon's front door. And I looked out, and it's Lisa Banfield, Gabriel's girlfriend. And I'm taking point this mind, I have nobody's killed at all. I know two houses are burnt, that's all I know. So I take my shotgun, shoo, well, it's on the bed. I run it, looked out, she's by herself, open door, pulls her in, shut the door, lock it. Jesus, Lisa, what are you doing here? Gabriel lost his mind, he went nuts, there's no shit, he burned his own house down. I remember the whole conversation, I wasn't in shock. I said, what are you doing here? He hates me the most. She was always should leave. He can't leave now. Leon knew Lisa from around the neighborhood, but he said they didn't know each other well. And as you heard him say, he and Wartman never got along. When she showed up at his house that morning, Leon knew he needed to call 911. And this is what he said happened next. Anyway, I dial 911, put her in the bathroom so she couldn't leave. Talked to the 911 operator, which I knew. I said, send SWAT. I know they're here looking for Gabriel. Get this woman out of my house. Of course, three SWAT vehicles show up. Stay on the phone with her. Yeah, okay, I'm staying on the phone. They're all walking across my yard in standard formation with their guns. I'm thinking, are you serious? Normally, they call you out of your house or whatever. I'm just picturing my head like, what's wrong with these guys? Mm. So anyway, I give Lisa my stinkers and my coat and I open the door and go out. And of course, they're all coming at me with the gun. My dogs go out. And I got a nine-month-old golden retriever. He's just goofy. My ba- basil, my black lab, smokes a radio to the guy by the truck. And he's excited, and his tail's going. And they take her. She got my government coat and my stinkers, and they take her, whisk her away. And here, buddy, got his gun right down on my gut, right on my dog's head. I told him, get his effing gun away from my dog. He told me he wasn't concerned about dogs. I turned around. Another guy's at my house. I walked back. I said, what do you want? He goes, anybody else in your house? I said, no. Another guy looked at my garage, which the door is open a foot like a roll-up door, a little shed. It's 12 by 24. What's in your garage? I said, garage stuff. Oh, okay. They get in their vehicles and leave. Leon said that was it. The police didn't bring him with them, and they didn't stay with him. He just went back inside. I go in, call a guy I work with. I tell him what a bunch of fools these fucking SWAT guys are. We're kind of making fun of them the way they come across my yard. So we joked around with that for a minute. I said, here comes another one. Another swap vehicle. I'll call you back. I hang the phone up. I go out and I flag this other guy down. They pull into my yard. Then finally, they latch You approach the front of the truck. I said, okay. I go to the front of the truck. Approach the side of the truck. Approach the rear truck. Door opens. Another rifle sticks out. I said, will you guys stop doing this? You're just hearing that the girl. I told you the same story. And he said, you got somewhere you can go? Yeah, well, you better get out of here. And they shut the door and they leave. I think I'm fucked then. I said, they don't know where this guy is. I run to my house, get my shotgun, throw up my truck, throw the dogs in the truck. As soon as I left, a neighbor called me and said, you're alive. I said, what are you talking about? He said, everybody's dead. I said, what do you mean everybody? And he started going through the list. And that's when shock hit me. Leon said he drove to Portapique Beach Road to leave town. He said the RCMP told him to go to the Great Village Fire Hall, their command post, and he was interviewed there. As the shock set in, the rest is a bit of a blur. Leon has been struggling with what happened that weekend, what he saw. After it happened, he couldn't sleep. He said his mind was racing, torturing him with the details. The images I have, and knowing what the words were and where the bodies were and my friends, It is just disturbing to me. So I think about it every day, and I think about the families outside of Porter Pick every day, and I stay in touch with some of those families, and I feel bad for those families. That pain and trauma was so deep, he couldn't bear to be in Porter Pick. That night was my last night when I woke up. I never stayed here again. In the days right after the tragedy, Leon would find himself lost on the same Nova Scotia roads he'd traveled for decades. 
Eventually, he couldn't even be in Nova Scotia. In mid-August of 2020, Leon packed up his trailer and his two dogs, the black lab named Basil and a golden retriever named Iserman, and he set out for Newfoundland for four and a half weeks. He camped along the coast to try and clear his head and finally get some sleep. He rarely stayed in one spot for long, even sleeping in graveyards some nights when it was the only level ground he could find to park in. It was the time and space he needed to try and get his bearings. Over the summer, he also put his house in Portapique up for sale, as have several others. I'm selling mine for the images I got in my head of driving around that night. I drive here and it's all I see. I'm not selling my house as of a Gabriel. I never, you know, that's, you know, no, it's what I drove around and my friends and every, it doesn't matter who buys these houses. They're my friends and I can't picture nobody else living in them and that's why I'm moving, but I can't sleep here. Can't shut my eyes, so. But that moment when Lisa was driven away from Leon's house by the RCMP's emergency response team is one that police have said was crucial. Because remember, all night they believed the gunman was in port pic Police sources have told us it looked to them like a mass murder-suicide. But then their suspect's partner turned up. And they had to question what that meant. Could he still be alive? We don't know exactly what happened to Lisa overnight. According to the court documents, police say Lisa was assaulted and handcuffed at the beginning of the rampage, that she escaped at some point and ran into the woods. Police haven't said exactly how that happened or when. The court documents say Lisa told police she initially hid in an unlocked vehicle, but then she worried the interior light would give her away. The documents say she left that hiding spot, but it's not clear where she went. The rest of that line has been redacted. The documents do say she spent the night in the woods, but we don't know whether she was able to find shelter from the cold. Police sources say she was the victim of a vicious assault at the beginning of the night, that she was clearly injured. They haven't said what those injuries were. On April 24th, RCMP Superintendent Darren Campbell referred to Wartman's attack on his partner as a catalyst for the events that weekend. And then four days later, he clarified what he meant by that. I do not want to leave anyone with the impression that the victim of that assault had, uh, that assault had anything to do with the gunman continuing on with his rampage. Um, the wording, the catalyst, was used uh, to, to express that that was the first victim in the series of very horrific events. And I want to uh, be very clear that violence against women is intolerable. Uh, it's real, it exists, and uh, I don't want to be misunderstood that uh, the victim uh, had any uh, blame in relation to what occurred or transpired uh, on those uh, awful days. We've tried to contact Lisa through family, and we've asked a lawyer representing her if she would share her side of the story. He declined on her behalf. But we know she was a crucial witness for police. She had information that could fill in some of the missing pieces. The RCMP had sent out notices to other police forces about vehicles the gunman may have been driving, possibly a former white police car, a white Mercedes, a Jeep, a truck. This is how Chief Superintendent Chris Leather explained it at a news conference on April 22nd, when he was asked when the police learned that the gunman was driving that real-looking police car and wearing a police uniform. Those details came in their totality to us early in the morning of Sunday uh, after a key witness was located and interviewed. Prior to that time, we did not have all those details. The bulk of the details about our suspect came to us at that time. Two days later, Superintendent Campbell gave more details at a different news conference. It was only after 6.30 in the morning or daybreak when a, when a victim emerged from hiding after she had called 911. Our officers responded, and it was at that time that through a significant, that significant key witness, we confirmed more details about Gabriel Wardman. This included the fact that he was in possession of a fully marked and equipped replica RCMP vehicle and was wearing a police uniform. We also learned that he was in possession of several firearms, 
that included pistols and long-barreled weapons. It was at that time that the police issued a BOLO, which is a be on the lookout for. That's a bulletin which included a description of the suspect and the vehicle to all police agencies in Nova Scotia. We maintained containment of the scene and continued to search for the suspect. Police said this is when they learned that Wartman was disguised as a police officer. So according to their timeline, it was around 6.30 a.m. that Lisa arrived at Leon's place. Police had to interview her to figure out what was going on, what she knew, and what that meant for their ongoing search. But if you remember from the early episodes, the RCMP had been told hours earlier about the mock police car the gunman was driving. Nearly eight hours earlier, in fact. That the car looked just like one of theirs. The first witness RCMP met in port pic that night, right around 10.30 p.m., told them he mistook the car and its driver for a real police officer, and then he was shot. It's this kind of inconsistency that has led to public mistrust of the official story and the official timeline police have released. This tragedy has had ripple effects. So many people have been deeply impacted by what happened that weekend, and Portapik was not the only community to witness the terror. As the black of night was just beginning to fade into a sunrise glow on the horizon on April 19th, Gabriel Wartman was on the move. About 45 minutes before Lisa emerged from the darkness and banged on Leon's door in Portapik, Wartman was caught on surveillance video. At 5.43 a.m., he left a quiet industrial area in the nearby community of DeBert. Police believe he spent the night there after he arrived just after 11 p.m. And as the sun rose, he drove toward the home of a couple he knew. Police say that mock police cruiser was captured passing by a home on Hunter Road near Wentworth, Nova Scotia, at 6.29 a.m., it's about a 45-kilometer drive from DeBert if you take the shortest route on Highway 4. Google Maps says this would take 38 minutes. Hunter Road is another small country road about 55 kilometers north of Portapique in the Bay of Fundy shoreline. It's a quiet area, peaceful. The route there takes you through the Wentworth Valley, cutting a path almost directly north toward the Northumberland shore. The valley is sparsely populated, a pleasant drive with long stretches of heavy forest, punctuated by views of the rolling, tree-covered mountains stretched out to the horizon. About halfway down Hunter Road is a long laneway, leading to the banks of the Wallace River. And right where the river makes a lazy S-turn was the home where Sean McLeod and Alana Jenkins were likely still asleep that Sunday morning. Their house was a beautiful stone and wood two-story with a big deck outside, usually filled with friends and family. Sean and Alana met through their work as corrections officers. And when they were introduced about five years ago, Sean's older daughter Taylor knew right away Alana brought out something special in her dad. Um, his his fun side. side. <laughs> yeah. He's um, a, he was pretty serious before her. <laughs> yeah, he was. And, yeah, she was just all about fun all the time. I sat down to talk with Taylor, who's 23, and her younger sister, Amelia, in the fall. You'll hear the two of them banter as they told me about Sean and Alana as a couple. That's and, another thing that made them so compatible. They, both, they like to be with people. Like, they always like to either, like, have us over or, like, be with their friends. Like, they were always... Family people yeah. and friendly people. Yeah, mm -hmm. they just liked being around people. They liked having people at their house. Like they, we would spend the whole summer there. Like yeah. cause they just always wanted us to be there. Like until it came time to clean everything up, <laughs> <laughs> all the food. Amelia and Taylor said the house was like something out of a Christmas card. I always told Dad that you know when you move away, I'll take the house off yeah. your hands. <laughs> it was beautiful. It was yeah. all wood inside, and like the outside was wood and stone and. It was beautiful. It just, yeah. The living room had like a huge. It was a twenty-two stone. foot ceiling. Yeah, with a huge stone fireplace yeah. that went up the whole ceiling. With or like a ceiling. look off, like on the upstairs. In photos, the pair is always smiling. Sean with what his daughters describe as a devilish grin. And when Taylor's daughter Ellie was born, she said Sean and Alana were immediately in love. 
they took Ellie to do more stuff than I did. And then there was the <laughs> ongoing joke that Ellie was actually their kid. Yeah, because <laughs> Alana, she literally looks like Dad and Alana put together. Like, it's really Alana weird. Alana was really tall. And Ellie has this for... strange height that we don't know where it came from because no one in our family is yeah. tall. And blonde hair and blue eyes. Yeah. <laughs> which like... me and my husband both have. Well, he has green and I have brown. And she has his hair, but she just really looked like Alana. It was really And weird. she has that <laughs> smile. And at times it's kind of creepy. Like, yeah. She'll she's... just smile and it'll be like, she's identical to my dad. Yeah. <laughs> Ellie was supposed to stay with Sean and Alana on the weekend of April 18th and 19th. But because of COVID-19 and changing schedules, the plans changed last minute. Taylor kept her little girl home, hoping to arrange another visit soon. Amelia had planned to drop by the house that Sunday morning to see her dad. He texted me and he said, you know, if it's nice Sunday, take a drive out and we'll sit on the deck. The girls spent a lot of time there. Sean and Alana's house had an open door policy. Friends were always welcome. But It had been a bit of a struggle to get together during the early days of the pandemic when everyone was being told to stay home. One of the first weekends, like after everything was called a pandemic, um, I went out and we had like a social distance visit and I sat on my car while they both cleaned their cars. (laughs) And Alana was trying to send me home with a bunch of stuff. She sent me home a bottle of wine for my mom. So she was like taking everything out of the house and Lysol wiping it. And she's like, pop your trunk and putting it into my trunk. And dad was just sitting there talking to me about everything. And, you know, it was nice. And I wish I hadn't been able to hug him that time because that was the last time I was able to see him. The gunman arrived at Sean and Alana's house just after 6.30 a.m. At the same time as Lisa Banfield knocked on Leon's door back in port but we don't know exactly what happened next because the gunman didn't leave Hunter Road for nearly three hours. Taylor was told by police that they believe Sean and Alana were murdered right away. He also killed their two dogs, a black lab and a chocolate lab. And eventually, he set their home on fire, burning it to the ground. But why did he drive all the way up Hunter Road in the first place? All the cops told us was that they felt that the gunman envied Dad and Alana's lives and that they felt that Dad might have had something that benefited him. Like, because our dad was a hunter, so he had guns, obviously, and ammo. And he stayed at their house for a couple hours after everything happened. So we think that he was looking through the house, basically, to find stuff. Taylor and Amelia wouldn't learn what happened until later in the morning. They, like many Nova Scotians, began hearing that something terrible had happened in Portapik the night before. And like so many people from the area, Taylor thought her dad may have had a connection to the tragedy. I woke up that morning and seen that, um, like, it was Greg and Jamie Blair that had been killed that morning. And I texted Dad at, like, 7 o'clock. And I said because his best friend worked for Greg Blair. And I said, oh, I said, did you see that it was Greg Blair? And this was at like seven. And at that point, it had already been done. And um, he never answered. When the gunman's name was eventually released, Amelia texted her dad to see if he had heard what was going on. Sean had actually lived in Portapik briefly, years ago. And according to the court documents, Lisa Banfield told police that Sean and Alana sometimes came over for drinks. She thought the gunman may have even gotten a corrections uniform and handcuffs from Sean. Lisa told police she thought the gunman seemed to like them both, and there were never any arguments, according to the documents. On that Sunday morning, Amelia was concerned. Yeah, I I texted him that morning to ask him if he heard about it because they released the name of the guy, and I knew he knew who it was. So I texted him to see if that's actually who it was. And then I found it weird that he didn't text back. And I found it weird that because my text didn't send as an iMessage, it sent as a text. And that never happens because they had unlimited data. So I found that kind of weird. And I kept checking my phone. I was like, it's weird that he hasn't answered. And then I get a call from his best friend.
Like so many families who've been affected by this, the sisters are left with questions they can't answer. Because we'd like to know what he was doing there for three hours, but we'll never really know Mm -hmm. that now. And why he burnt their house. But at the same time, we think we're kind of glad that he did because I know I wouldn't have been able to go into it. That home that held so many happy memories was gone. Taylor and Amelia are trying to focus on the lessons their dad left them with. I grew up going hunting and fishing with him, so I learned a lot of that stuff with him. Um, Pretty much, like, everything I know about outside stuff, I learned from him. Like, he always taught me to... My husband's not very handy. (laughs) So he always taught me, like, you're better off to just pay someone to do it right the first time. 18-year-old Amelia is planning to honor them both by following in their footsteps. So I am going into corrections. Dad and I talked about it a lot. Um, Grade 9, I went with them for Take Your Kid to Work Day. (laughs) And ever since then, corrections has kind of always been in my back pocket. And then everything happened, and I realized that corrections was really what I wanted to do. It's kind of in my blood, I guess, per se, mm-hmm. with him. Like, he told me, he's like, I'm not going to talk you out of it. He said, but you do know what you're getting yourself into. Over the summer, Taylor brought a camper out to Hunter Road. She brought cases of her dad's favorite beer, a local brew called a Crafty Rattler, and spent the warm, sunny days on the riverbank with her husband, her daughter, and sister. But it was really hard, like, at first. When we went, we'd go tubing out there all the time, like, down the river. And you'd get in up the river and you'd tube down to Dagalanas. But it'd be really hard coming around the turn and not seeing the house there. Because it was so big. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of hard to miss. As soon as you came around the yeah. corner and you'd see, like, Dad or Alana standing there waiting for you to come up and get a drink. or Like, they were so open to everyone. I... They were willing to help anyone. And they just loved they were... being around people. This is where we'll leave you for now. Just before 8 a.m. on Sunday, April 19th on Hunter Road. The police had no idea where Gabriel Wartman was, and still the public had not been warned that a violent killing spree had begun. Nova Scotians went about their mornings not knowing about the danger. It's frustrating. That's the nicest word I can say. It's incredibly frustrating. Um, You wake up every morning hoping you're going to wake up from a nightmare, and you can't grieve if you don't have answers. (laughs) You, You can't grieve if you don't don't have the whole story. So we just want to be able to start our grieving process. That's next time on 13 Hours. Thank you so much for joining us this week. 13 Hours Inside the Nova Scotia Massacre is written and produced by me, Sarah Ritchie, and Alex Cress. Our story producer is Dila Velasquez. Sound design and audio production by Rob Johnston. Editing assistance from Neil Benedict. Emergency radio recordings for this episode provided by Broadcastify. Special thanks to Don Cuthbertson, the National Director of Content and Editorial Standards for Global News. I'd love to have you tell a friend about this podcast, and you can help me share these important stories by rating and reviewing 13 Hours on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. We have much more on our website, including articles, maps, and photos, all of that written and curated by Brian Hill, Alex Cress, and me. Just head to globalnews.ca slash 13 hours. You can also find us on Instagram at 13 hours podcast. And if you have a question about this episode and series, please get in touch on social media or by email at 13 hours at curiouscast.ca. I'd love to hear from you. Our contact information is in the show notes too. Thanks again for listening. Please join me next time. <laughs>